Okay, um, so uh, I am Damien. I, I was uh, uh, introduced a lot by Bruno before, but uh, my work at least. Uh, I will present my work that I started during my PhD at AVI and actually five years ago at the, the chance of <laughs> coming here. Uh, and I was a first year PhD student, so I didn't know anything. I learned a lot and, and I'm really happy to be back here. Uh, that's what changed for me in these last five years, probably. <laughs> Um, so yeah, and, and now I'm a, a postdoc at McGill University uh, with Bruno and we uh, call, uh, work, uh, I work also with Jean-Francois and I will present as well work uh, that I am doing with Neil Souta and, uh, and Louisa van Albedu. Um, so I will talk about LKF's intersection angles in sea ice. First, I will present some observations and then uh, how we, we, uh, we use it to build mechanical properties for the sea ice viscous plastic model. <clears throat> so, when we look at uh, sea ice, this is a Sentinel-1 uh, image from the East Siberian Sea. We can see these, these lines of deformation, and that's what we call the linear kinematic features, or LKF. And you can see here that they, they intersect a lot, and, um, um, and that's what we are going to, to look at when I say intersection angle. But first, why do we care about LKFs? Because LKFs are kind of the hotspots of processes in, in sea ice. It's where we have open water and thin ice formation. We have shear and convergence, so it's uh, thick ice formation. So it controls really the, the thermodynamics and the, the, the future deformations of sea ice because we have the, the thin ice is, is uh, deforming faster than, fast, than, than thick ice. It's uh, important because it's, it's a barrier. Um, so it's a barrier for movement on the ice. It's also a path for navigation uh, in the water, so it influences human communities, also, also animals and, and biology. So we, uh, we know that accurate LKF representation is essential for accurate sea ice predictions at, uh, um, uh, at least a regional scale. Um, now, if we, we look at, at, again, at this image, we, have, uh, we, we want to know what's happening here. So what we can do is use uh, this uh, Sentinel-1 image and also uh, a GPS image to see, uh, to look at sea ice deformation. And this is, um, so this is a, a Sentinel-1 image where we uh, extracted uh, deformation and the colors here you see are vorticity. Vorticity, uh, so in, in, in red is going to be a positive vorticity, in blue is going to be negative. And from this, we can actually extract from the uh, LKFs if it's go, um, in which way it is deforming. So we, can, we know that this LKF has an intersection angle of 43 degrees and not uh, the complementary angle, um, <clears throat> just for the vorticity. So using the, the algorithm from Niels to extract all the LKFs in the RGPS and Sentinel-1, uh, uh, um, uh, it's a Sentinel-1 data set from Mosaic, we can look at the distribution of angles. Um, and that's, uh, that's the, the PDF of the intersection angles of, P, of, um, of LKFs in the RGPS and Mosaic, and they agree, agree very well. And we have a large predominance of small intersection angles. Um, these two data sets have, have different resolutions. We have uh, LGPS around 12 kilometers, um, <clears throat> Sentinel around one. So actually, I, I may uh, contradict Bruno on this one, and we can wonder if we see the same angles at one kilometer uh, is a small scale experiment could also be, uh, be used to infer mechanical properties of sea ice. And that's something I'm actually waiting for is to get uh, info, um, deformation data from the sea ice radar of Mosaic. So maybe we can uh, look if we see again the same angle at even uh, as, uh, a finer resolution. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we know from uh, the Cyrex work of, of Niels uh, Hutter that, that the models, they, they fail usually to reproduce the, the distribution, this distribution of angles. Now let's talk uh, about sea ice uh, models, uh, sea ice rheology. So along these, we have small scale dynamical processes. We have uh, ice flows interest, uh, interacting. So what we want to model is the internal, internal stress. So we use a, a sea ice rheological model, and in, in the case I'm going to, to talk about, it's always about viscous plastic rheological model. Uh, basically, the idea is that sea ice re, uh, have a different stress for different uh, deformation um, uh, uh, um, 
deform <laughs> deformation uh, pattern. So if, if we deform in this in uh, in shear or in, in divergence or convergence. So what we do is we define the constitutive equation that relates the deformation, the strain rate to the stress. And for this, we need a, a yield curve and a flow rule. As Mathieu introduced, uh, the, the yield curve is, is where we de deform uh, plastically. Inside, we, discuss, uh, we, we uh, deform in a, in a viscous manner. And we define on the yield curve what we call a flow rule. So that's the direction of the deformation. Is it going to be uh, in convergence or divergence? And how much in shear? So it can be all the way in between. And when we write the constitutive equation, the flow rule can be normal as uh, the, the red, like the red arrow, or it can be non-normal like the, the two orange uh, arrows that you can see here. So uh, now, how do we link, uh, I'm, I'm talking about intersection angle, how would we link this intersection angle to, uh, to the rheology? So that was the work of, uh, that I did mainly during my PhDs to, to try to understand this, and I'm continuing now. And we have basically two theories uh, that link this, link this angle. There is the Coulomb angle that's linked only to the yield curve, so linked to the stress uh, characteristics uh, that was uh, uh, derived before in Pritchard and, and, and Wang 2007. So that would be uh, linked to the internal angle of friction, like the, 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 in, in blue, the, the phi uh, on the picture. Um, <clears throat> so really the stress that uh, um, is along the LKFs in, in our uh, ice. Uh. And there is another theory that developed in the 70s by uh, Roscoe, that we call Roscoe angle. So it links to the value of uh, the, the flow rule. So the deformation that happened inside the LKF, so the, the, the flow rule, and that would be what we call the, the delatency angle delta, so the, the ratio of shear and divergence inside, inside our LKF or inside our uh, shear band, as we call sometimes. And uh, in, in previous paper, so uh, yeah, one, one thing, when, uh, when we have a normal flow, we have our, our phi and our delta are the same angles. So uh, basically, Kulo and Roscoe angle are giving the, uh, giving the same answer. And uh, we show that for the, for the elliptical yield curve with normal flow, we get uh, this, we get the, the, the theory is, works very well. We have a good correspondence to, to the simulation. And when we use a non-normal flow with an ellipse, we actually have more a Roscoe theory that emerge from, from the simulations. Uh, and <clears throat> so now um, what we can do is to uh, take these, these theories and, uh, oh yeah, that, that's basically the same in stress space, but uh, I will move on. Uh, when we, we use, when, when we take the intersection angle distribution, we can uh, try to, uh, we can link it using these two theories to kind of create the shape of a, a yield curve or what we call a plastic potential. That's the, the curve that we use to define the flow rule in, in our uh, viscous plastic models. <clears throat> so using this uh, distribution of intersection angle, uh, we can kind of recreate a yield curve. And uh, this yield curve looks more like a, a the, or, uh, uh, this, this shape of yield curve or plastic potential, uh, it looks more like a teardrop or a more Coulomb shape. So because we have uh, small angles that are uh, more prominent in sea ice, and it, it doesn't look at all like an ellipse. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's actually similar, to, uh, a bit similar to a paper that was uh, published in 2007 when uh, um, they use, uh, we have much more uh, angles because we use this automatic LKF extraction. And we also use the, the vorticity to be able to extract the, the, the angle, the, 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 the principal axis of, uh, of stress. So, um, <clears throat> so we get this yield curve um, and wonder like, uh, and I'm going to, 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 uh, to uh, investigate this for the model uh, after. Uh, what we did is to try to validate this method, we used it in the results of the model and we can see that um, for the MHCCM at two kilometers, we can uh, kind of guess, uh, get a, a yield curve that looks like, an, uh, so that, that's uh, the top of the ellipse, so that would be just the, the, the part that here. What's surprising is we get kind of the same yield curve for the three, uh, three uh, real, um, three runs with different values of, of E. So that, that was a bit surprising, but at least we get kind of uh, an, an elliptical shape of, uh, of uh, uh, yield curve. Um, 
one surprising thing that I want to talk about is that when, when we have all this LKF data set with the angles, we can also look at what's happening with the dilatancy, this angle delta. And we can see that we have really no relationship between the uh, intersection angle and the delta, which questions if the normal flow or the Roscoe angle are valid for, for our model. Um, I think that's a, a really remaining question. And well, I'm wondering if we're just not observing the good dilatancy angle because we have low temporal resolution or if it's just not there and uh, that, that questions the validity of, of uh, these assumptions. Now, um, let's move on to yield curves and the viscous plastic models. If you look at literature, we have, uh, dif um, we have different yield curves that were defined in the past. There was uh, the teardrop and parabolic lens yield curve from uh, Zhang and Rosrock in 2005 and the Moncolon yield curve from Ipetal in, in 91. Um, uh, the teardrop and power lens use the normal flow rule, the Moncolon use a shear only uh, non-normal flow rule. So we tested this, this yield curve um, in an idealized experiment. So we just have a block of ice, we block it on one side and we push on another, uh, and we see which angle we get. Uh, it's, very, it's very simple, so we have only one stress uh, condition for our ice it makes it really easy to know where we are on the yield curve. Uh, and then we see what happens maybe uh, in the simulation if it's also opening or, uh, or ridging. Uh, I have a, a small video uh, for to give you an idea. So that, oh, well, we don't see the fracture lines yet, but uh, you can see here uh, our, our piece of ice with uh, a D ellipse and uh, a Moncon yield curve I'm going to, to talk about later. I can see a bit the, so you can see how the ice is going to, is, is opening and we have a uh, deformation that ensues. Uh, I really like this video I wanted to, to share. And we have really uh, like thinner ice that's like kind of flowing a bit like, like sand. Um, <clears throat> so, so now results of, of intersection angle with the teardrop and the parabolic lens, even though the teardrop is more interesting to her, to us. So you can see here the intersection angle as function of the tensile factor, uh, KT. So that, no, no. Uh, but it, it's the only parameter of, of our teardrop yield curve. So we can create smaller angle in the range between 30 and 60 degrees, which is what's interesting to us. It follows the theoretical angle of the normal flow as we expect. Um, as a drawback of this, this yield curves is that it would lead to more divergence because uh, basically in the teardrop, we, are, we have a lot more diver uh, space of, of yield curve that is in divergence at convergence. And as I said, the only parameter of this yield curve is the tan size strength. So that's maybe something that we don't want to have coupled with uh, our, uh, our uh, intersection angles. And now for uh, the Moncoulon yield curve of IP, we have this uh, really, uh, um, <laughs> and satisfactory uh, results that we, we, you see the angles compared to the slope parameter. So basically the internal angle of friction and it doesn't follow uh, any of the two theories. Uh, it's quite, it's large angles. We, we are not in the 30 to 60 degrees uh, range. And we, we saw that it's very, very slow to, to uh, numeric converge, so not ideal. So we, we started to look at this rheology and we find that it has very complex behavior with uh, uh, plastic only uh, plastic behaviors that are only situated at the tips and half plastic half viscous on the on the on the limbs on the more limbs uh, also on the compressive side and we are only we are viscous uh, inside but this is uh, that's my theory why why this yield curve is, is not converging well so that's why we wanted to to de define new uh, Moncolon yield curve so we uh, inspired ourselves from a uh, paper by Hibler and Scarson in 2000, uh, building a Moncoulon yield curve with an elliptical plastic potential where we have a, a Moncoulon yield curve in blue and the, the pl uh, plastic potential in red that defines a flow that varies uh, um, continuously from divergence to convergence all along the Moncoulon yield. Um, <clears throat> we also, uh, with, with Jean-Francois, we worked on trying a lot of different Moncolon yield curve, and we found a lot of ways not to define Moncolon yield curve. We, we tried, so now with the teardrop plastic potential and with a, a parabolic lens uh, plastic potential. So, uh, so now we, we, tr we are trying this and the, the results are, are still uh, surprising. So 
uh, you can see here again the intersection angle as function of the slope parameter mu. So that would be the, really the slope of this blue line here. Uh, we can see that first we can have intersection angles in the 30 to 60 uh, degree range. Uh, we have much faster numerical convergence, but we still don't really understand where uh, how the, the, the angles uh, are related to uh, the yield curve parameters. Uh, you, you have here is the theory for the Roscoe angle. In black, you have the theory for the Kulo angle, and it doesn't match. Um, <clears throat> one thing is that it's a bit surprising, but it, it matches better when we use what's called the Archer angle, which is half Kulo angle and half uh, 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 Roscoe angle. That's a, a non empirical relationship from uh, observation of uh, granular materials. And we repeated, so this is with the more colon yield curve with an elliptical uh, plastic potential with a uh, ellipse axis pressure of 1.4. If we repeat this with another uh, uh, elliptic, elliptical uh, ellipse aspect ratio, we have actually a similar uh, behavior. So that's really something that we are continuing to uh, test at the moment with the more colon yield curve with the teardrop and parabolic lens plastic potential. Um, uh, yeah, so that's that's actually running at the moment. So I, I don't have results about this yet. But to summarize, uh, the teardrop and parallel lens yield curve uh, can have like smaller intersection angle. They use a, a normal throw uh, uh, formulation. We uh, can uh, use more Coulomb yield curve with a non-normal throw formulation and create small angle, even though we don't really understand. Uh, the relationship between uh, intersection angles and and, uh, and our yield curve. As a, an outlook, I would say that um, that this is only uh, this is only uh, ideas experiment. And I would actually move to uh, w that's what we we started to do with Mathieu and, and Jean Francois Lemieux is to uh, study what's the effect of geology on a panarchy simulation. And we can use the LKF tracking algorithm of Niels to. To, uh, to actually see if the angles is changing. Uh, another point is that mesh, um, now we use the LKF's intersection angle to see if the, uh, um, to, to relate the, the deformations to the yield curve, but we could actually use machine learning to track to extract the yield curve from the CI. So that's something that uh, we started to think about. And we also uh, uh, also uh, interested in the mu i, um, Rheology, it's a, a more Coulomb that, uh, that has this kind of uh, dependence on flow size. And I see, I saw that uh, Agnes Karaman actually uh, published a paper like a few days ago about this. So maybe we're going to hear about it uh, in our talk uh, tomorrow, I think. So yeah, that's all. Um, and I, I just like looking forward to a day where we can actually reproduce uh, these kind of uh, deformation patterns in the Arctic with really small, uh, small angles. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Yep, thank you, Damien. We have plenty of time for discussion. Who would like to start with a question? Hey, thanks for this beautiful talk. Uh, why would it work to have this uh, Average between the Rosco angle and the Kulo angle. Like, do you have any idea why? Uh... Uh, not, not a clue. Uh, I, I'm really puzzled by this actually because when we use a, an elliptical yield curve with a, with a non-normal throw, we get the the Rosco angle. So, and I was expecting to get the same with with our more Coulomb, but we don't. And from the results that uh, that I have running now, it seems that with the more Coulomb yield curve, we don't get uh, the Roscoe angle nor the Coulomb angle, and I, I don't really understand why. But that seems to be the case. Um, and I was actually wondering if it's because the more Coulomb yield curve is we always have the same ratio of shear stress to uh, normal stress, so maybe that could have an influence. It doesn't satisfy like strictly the, the Drucker's um, um, postulate for, for stability of uh, plastic deformation. So yield curves need to be normally, they need to be convex. 
but this the Mokolo is not because it, it's a lie. So that's my theories, but I, I really don't understand. And if someone has an idea, I would be uh, glad to uh, discuss this. Other questions? I'm not sure whether you can hear me. Yeah, it's um, Erlen Scholson speaking from abroad. Uh, no, thank you for the um, for the talk. It's just not really a question. It's just uh, an observation. Did you try to follow your what happened in your sample in terms of invariant instead of stress? Uh, following it with uh, P and Q, and because uh, I know it's standard for geomechanics to follow like rocks in terms of, uh, of stress invariant. And sometimes it can bring you new. Uh... Yeah, so what you call P and Q, if I'm not mistaken, that's what I call S, S1 and S2 in this form. So that's, that's the, we define our, our yield curve in, in stress environments. Oh, okay, sorry. Then yeah. I no, just no uh, missed, uh, missed the point. Okay, thank you. I always confuse when I see P and Qs in <laughs> other papers. But yeah, that's the invariant. The online question? The online question? Hey, Damu, thanks for the interesting talk. I have one question. Like, did you find any difference uh, in simulating CS thickness when you update the MC with the parabolic yield curve? Well, uh, if I see differences in the CI thickness? Yeah, or other CS characters. But my simulations are, are very short and, and idealized. So like we can see as the floor rule changes, we can see that the, the, the CI sickness doesn't behave the same in the, in the, uh, in the fractures, but we don't, uh, I, I don't, I don't like, I would need to do panarctic simulations or maybe uh, bigger simulations uh, for, uh, to, to see this. That most of the simulation I use here, right? the, the video I show is a bit long, but usually I do five seconds uh, until I get a clear LKF form in, in the ice because I'm only interested in the initial fracture. So when we don't have any effect of heterogeneity. Thanks. Okay, there's one online. Yes, I don't know whether you can hear me there. It's Erwin Scholz speaking. Does this work? Yes, can you hear? No, I, I don't get sound. Yes. Can you hear from? Is the yep, that you can type a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm waiting. Does he type it now? Mm -hmm. I will check. Is there other, other questions? I will ask him. Yes, again, I do have a question about the physics of fracture, what you're seeing. Can you can you can you hear this? I'm sorry, the assistant. My question is this: I don't quite understand anything about the physics you are employing. But if I understand correctly, what you have shown us, I asked him to type the question. Yes. Uh, Again, what I am saying is there's something not quite right with what you're showing us, particularly when you showed us in slide 13, loading under uniaxial compression, you showed failure occurring through shearing. That's not the way failure occurs under uniaxial state of stress in a brittle mode. Under that uniaxial state of stress, failure occurs through splitting along the direction of the principal stress. And that comes out through the fracture physics. And you have it shown as about 45 degrees, which is a plastic non, you know, a von Mises type failure, which is not the way failing. So I have a great deal of any predictions you're making based upon a model that's aphysical. 
I, I didn't get everything, but in in Unix are loading like this. I'm just guessing what Erlen's asking, okay? But I'm guessing his concern is that under uniaxial failure, you'd expect axial splitting rather than shear failure, compressive shear failure. Compressive shear failure should arise if you have compressive shear, which is not the same as uniaxial stress. Uh, but I'm, this is my interpretation of Erlen's yeah. question. <laughs> Uh, uniaxial splitting, if I'm not mistaken, you, you would expect like one line like this and no, or yeah. Precisely, uh, my, I think that, I, I'm, I'm just guessing, but I think Erland's saying you need some confinement for there to be compressive shear stresses enabling this shear failure. Mm. Well. The, yeah, maybe I don't know if he means in nature or, or in the model, but in the model that I think he means in reality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I, I, like it's possible, but when you know, I wonder. Like, if I imagine a piece of ice, I would expect it to break like this, not with a forty-five degree angle. As this is just a drawing I did, but. Yeah. So he, he, he typed what physics governs failure in your model? Which, which? What physics governs the failure in your model? But that's, so this is the viscous plastic uh, uh, rheology with, uh, yeah. with, with the yield curve. So what happens is when we load uni actually, we, we basically are on a path with uh, S1. Uh, equal uh, S2 equal minus S1. So we are going to load like this. And depending where we, we end up on the yield curve, we're going to fail with a certain ratio of, of, of shear and normal stress. And then the, the, the flow is going to, like the, the, this ratio or the flow, depending on the theory, is going to, to uh, decide how, how to fracture. But I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, Okay, I, I we, think maybe it's good yeah, we could for you talk. to have a chat with him yeah. afterwards. Hmm? Okay, yeah. Thank you very much to all three speakers for this session. You want to make an announcement? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, in terms of the mill this evening, so a few of you hadn't signed up and have added your name to the list. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I cannot add people now. But two people who were going to go are not going. So I have two slots. Two slots for people who do not have any special dietary requirements. Okay. So um, can I please have a quick word with um, Steph Stefan Perard, Samuel Brenner, and Sarah Keeley?